Last time on Everdark, vampire confessor Fiona Darksilver starts to make her move, and Balthazar starts to wonder if his house guest is really the great vampire king. Oh, and if he is, how can Balthazar use that to his advantage? Everdark, Episode 23, Kinds Hunting that word was not something that Christian usually associated with obtaining a meal. One went to the grocery store, or out to a restaurant, or even just to the refrigerator. But hunting? To hunt? To have to go out and actually hunt down food? Not to mention that the food would be as smart as you were, and for it to be quite illegal to eat. In fact, to be found out was to threaten all vampire kind. Nothing to be nervous about. Christian thought dryly. His face reflected back at him in the mirror, though it showed he was nervous. His lips were pressed tightly together, his jaw clenched and unclenched. His fangs, though, were not coming out. It was as if eating was the last thing he wanted to do. Because we're going to be eating from people, but not killing them. And Balthazar will be the one feeding from them, and me from him. He smoothed his hands down the front of his shirt and took in a breath to steady himself. His reflection looked slightly more at ease. As he usually did when he was anxious about something, he listed out all the reasons that things would be fine. Balthazar knows what he's doing. He may be slightly ridiculous when it comes to certain things, a little reactive, very emotional, but he was able to stop that entire room of vampires with the force of his mind. Humans should be even easier to control, so I'm safe with them. Yet this wouldn't be an easy encounter with an acolyte who wished to be with them, who wanted it. These people would not be willing. They might even be afraid. When they realized that Balthazar was a vampire, what would they do? Would they simply already be in a trance? He was certain that Julian was already deep into the business of feeding from Damon. His best friend was always eager to try new things. Julian would leap before he looked all the time. There would be the crash later, when he came down from eating strange food, drinking unclean water, repelling off that ledge. But while Julian was in the moment, he would be golden. Christian was not that way. He studied everything from every angle and, truthfully, was not a big fan of change. And becoming a vampire is the biggest change of all. Christian, everything okay? Balthazar asked from his bedroom. Christian had left the vampire lord fussing around with the bed since it was now clear that Damon and Julian would not be using his bedroom again. Christian saw his actions rather like a cat, inspecting where it normally slept after another cat had sat there. I'm fine, Christian said with a final look at himself in the mirror. Ready to go. Christian stepped out of the bathroom and saw that the bed had been completely stripped and remade for the second time that night. Christian's eyebrows rose. Didn't you already change the linen after Julian threw up? Are you changing it again because Damon laid there for like one hour? Christian asked. Both of them looked over the perfectly made bed that was heaped with mounds of pillows, a dark purple comforter, and a fur blanket lying across the bottom of the bed. Well, I was having your room prepared with fresh linen, so I thought I would do my own at the same time. Balthazar shrugged. My room? Christian couldn't keep the shock out of his voice. He couldn't have heard this right. Wasn't this his room? Or rather the room he shared with Balthazar. He had been wondering what the sleeping arrangements were going to be. He had been planning on erecting a pillow barrier between them at the very least. Yet here Balthazar was offering him a room of his own. Yes. Would you like to see it before we leave? Can't take too long, as the night is getting away from us. Balthazar told him casually. Too casually. He knows this is a big deal. Well, I, I thought... Christian stopped. He wasn't sure how to phrase this, but then decided direct was best. I thought you intended for me to have to sleep in here, with you. Balthazar cleared his throat and shuffled a little bit, which was incongruent to his elegant attire and demeanor. I did. But then I realized that's not what you wanted. Besides, everyone needs their own space. Where is it? M my room, that is. Christian wasn't sure he believed that this room existed. Two doors down. Balthazar tipped his head in the direction of Christian's room. Not right next door? No adjoining chambers or anything like that? 
Christian fully expected there to be some way other than the hallway door for Balthazar to get to him, but the vampire lord shook his head. Like I said, everyone needs their own space. Shall we go see it? He offered again. Christian, though, had not moved. He felt like he was waiting for the other shoe to drop. There had to be some catch. This was Balthazar, after all. The vampire lord sighed and rubbed his forehead. I can see what you're thinking, Christian, even though I can't quite read your mind, Balthazar said. And you think that there's some funny business going on here? Quite frankly, yes. Christian crossed his arms over his chest. You've made it quite clear about what you think a relationship between a master and fledgling must be, and it involves a lot of touching and definitely sleeping in the same room. Balthazar flashed one of those grins that Christian was finding less annoying and almost endearing. You are right and wrong. Explain, please. That I want there to be touching and being together. Balthazar gestured to the bed. But not that there must be. I want you to want me. It's as simple as that. And I can't make you do that. Christian's arms unfolded and hung down by his sides. After everything I've seen you do, I'm pretty sure you could make me. I would never make you, Balthazar said, and all of his usual amusement was completely gone. No, of course you wouldn't. Not after what Roan did to all of you. Christian suddenly felt cold and rubbed his arms. Balthazar obviously didn't want either of them to think about Roan too long, so he waggled his eyebrows as he said, I notice that you're also saying that I'm impressive and powerful. And... I think you're fully aware of your own power, Christian replied dryly. But to hear it from one's own fledgling is, how shall I say, wonderful, especially if that fledgling is you, Balthazar answered. Because you don't exaggerate things. Well, I think I've stroked your ego enough tonight, especially after that kiss. I don't know why I did that. Likely the intimacy of the moment, but that should have had me withdrawing, not moving towards him like that. Then let's see your room, and we shall be off. Christian followed Balthazar out of the bedroom and two doors down the hall. The vampire lord pushed open the door with his fingertips and stepped back so that Christian could walk in first. He moved inside, not sure what he expected. The room was modern, with clean lines, maple flooring and furniture with cool grey-blue walls. There was a king-sized bed with neutral bedding. It looked cool and crisp. There was a desk with a sleek Mac laptop. There was a walk-in closet that smelled pleasantly of cedar. Finally, there was an ensuite bathroom in icy white with dual pedestal sinks and a floor-to-ceiling glass enclosed shower with multiple shower heads. Christian padded out of the bathroom to where Balthazar was standing, waiting for him. While this was different from his room at Wingate, Wingate was more traditional with honey woods and country accents, but this room felt like him. It would make being here away from his true home easier. Well, how do you like it? You can, of course, change whatever you like. As Sophia has demonstrated, we have a substantial decorating budget, Balthazar said, rocking back and forth on his heels. It's fine as is. I think I'll let Sophia have my decorating budget, Christian said, and he almost felt shy about it. Thank you for this, Balthazar. Of course. I want you to feel this is your home, Christian, Balthazar said with a faint smile. I know you want that, Christian said. He didn't say that he wanted that too. All of this was too confusing. He was out of his usual spot and still wanted his life to go back to what it was, but that wasn't going to happen. His logical brain told him that he had to figure out how to go forward and not mourn for what was lost. Come, Christian. We only have a few hours before we must return. Balthazar extended a hand to him, gesturing Christian to precede him out of the room. Guys, I just want to give you a heads up that this has been edited. The complete episode is in both the audiobook version, which you can purchase from the Wraith Rain shop, and it's in the private member podcast feed 
which has the chapters uploaded to stream right from a page on the membership site. So if you sign up to be a Wraith Rain member, you can stream this chapter and a heck of a lot more, and it's all unedited. Or if you purchase the audiobook, you get the full audiobook, nothing edited. Because we have our own platform at WraithRain.com, we don't depend on YouTube or Spotify like so many other content creators do. So we can create and publish the full chapters with all that sexiness, complete with romantic scenes on our own site. Balthazar took them to the garage again, like he had when they went to rescue Julian from the Siren Blood Den. But this time, instead of getting into one of the SUVs, the Vampire Lord took them to a jet-black Mercedes convertible. Even though the air was chilly, Balthazar put down the top. You'll find that you don't feel the cold like you used to, Balthazar explained, before he pulled the sedan out in a fluid, confident movement. They were soon off the manor's grounds and onto the curving, darkened streets of the town. Balthazar did not head into the downtown where the blood den was, but instead got onto the highway that led to the nearest large city, about twenty minutes away. The cold breeze was like a caress against Christian's skin. He leaned his head back against the headrest and closed his eyes as the luxury car raced over the asphalt like it was a spool of unending silk. He only opened them when Balthazar asked him a question. What did you say? Christian asked. His mind had been obsessed with the whistle of the wind and he hadn't heard the question. Balthazar gave him a wicked smile. I asked, what kind of prey did you want to hunt tonight? What kind? Christian frowned. That had Balthazar chuckling. He shifted gears and effortlessly moved around two semis and several speeding sedans. His movements were incredibly precise. Christian realized that vampire reflexes were at least twice as fast as human ones, probably more than that. Balthazar hardly seemed to pay attention to the vehicles around them as he effortlessly weaved around them and left them in his dust, but there was never a sense that he didn't know the obstacles that were around them. Balthazar was perfectly aware of their surroundings at all times. The ultimate predator. Ah, I'm not suggesting different species. Obviously, humans are the best. Other animals will drive us crazy. So. The issue is what kind of human we go after, Balthazar explained. W what kind of humans are there? Christian frowned, his forehead puckering. Oh, Christian, with such a scientific mind, you are being very unimaginative. Is that because you're worried about choosing anyone at all? Balthazar fully turned his head towards Christian. The urge to tell him to look at the road was high, especially when a car darted in front of them, but without looking forward at all. Balthazar neatly avoided that maneuver and managed to snake through all of the traffic and into an empty span of road with no one but them. Christian let out a breath that he turned into a sigh as if put upon. You tell me what you mean about different kinds. I don't lump humans together like you do. Yet, you'll start to see humanity differently after a time. You'll have to, otherwise it will cause you too much distress. The last was said softly. We're not going to kill anyone, right? Christian asked sharply. He thought he already knew the answer, but he wanted to be sure. Of course not. Balthazar reached to touch his shoulder, but instead lowered his hand quickly before he touched Christian. Christian actually ached when Balthazar didn't touch him. He didn't dismiss this reaction immediately. He studied it. He realized, with a little start of discomfort as Balthazar was still an unknown quantity, that he was beginning to depend on the Vampire Lord to make him feel comfortable in this brand new world. I'm really dividing humanity into those we might find attractive, and that doesn't just mean physical attraction, and those, well, the bad ones, the villains, the ones that intend to do harm, Balthazar explained. Christian thought about this. What Balthazar was asking him was whether he wanted to go after people that attracted him in some way or to stop those that were hurting others. He immediately had an answer. The bad ones, Christian said. If we're going to hunt people, let's at least pair it with doing something good. Balthazar merely nodded. He didn't question Christian's choice. In fact, Christian was pretty sure that Balthazar understood exactly why he wanted to go after those causing harm. 
How will we find the wrongdoers, though? Christian asked as they silkily threaded their way through traffic and aimed for an exit that would take them through a very bad part of the nearby city. I can smell violence, Balthazar explained. His lips pursed as though that did not fully explain what he experienced. The Iros power of mind control is often seen as imposing one's will upon another, but that's not accurate. We see inside their minds and know exactly how to influence them. So you read their minds? Christian qualified. He gave a brief nod. It's more and less than that. For example, I know that in that apartment building on the fourth floor, a man is about to rape a woman. Brutally. He intends to use a hammer. Christian jerked back in his seat, then said, well, Let's stop that. All right. Again, there was no hesitation as Balthazar exited the highway and glided silently through the worn streets where the concrete was broken, the buildings were sad, and the people were afraid. Balthazar turned their headlights off as soon as they left the highway. Christian immediately realized that he had no trouble seeing in the dark. In a way, the headlights had been a distraction. The vampire lord turned into an alleyway where the fire escape surrounded them on both sides like an Escher painting. The purr of the engine was cut off as Balthazar pressed the engine button. Silence fell, except it wasn't really silent. If Christian had still been human, the alleyway would have seemed quiet, but to his vampiric senses it was anything but. There was a man on the first floor with sleep apnea. Christian could hear the labored breathing followed by the ominous pause and then a gasp as the man drank air down greedily. There was a woman on the second floor who had bad gas that night. She would fart and then let out a sigh of relief. There was a child on the third floor that was having bad dreams and letting out little whimpers as if she were being chased. And then there were the couple on the fourth floor. Even as a human, he would have heard the sharp words between them. Hers were shrill with anger and fear. His were barks of rage that were barely contained. The hair on the back of Christian's neck stood on end. Violence was definitely in the air. Balthazar got out of the car in one liquid movement. He didn't bother with putting the top up or even slipping the key fob that allowed the car to be turned on into his pocket. He simply left the key there and the car open. Christian was betting that no one stole from a vampire and got away with it for very long. Besides, the night was long and deep. There was no one around in this stinking alleyway in this bad part of the city. They were the top predators in any event. Christian joined him. How do we get up? Christian doubted that they were heading in the front door. He was right. Balthazar crouched down and then lightly leaped up onto the first floor's fire escape. The metal did not even rattle when the vampire lord landed. Balthazar was about to release the ladder for him, but Christian made a movement to indicate he shouldn't. Christian was going to try to leap just as Balthazar had. The vampire lord grinned and stepped back from the railing so that Christian had plenty of room to land. Christian felt rather like a cat as he crouched down and waggled his butt, winding up for the leap. And he did leap. He went up into the air but soared past the first stairwell, but not quite to the second. He started to fall back down, his hands scrabbled at the air. Balthazar caught him around the wrists and effortlessly hauled him up onto the fire escape. Christian's heart was pounding and he clutched at the vampire lord for long moments. Balthazar gently stroked his back, but was careful not to go lower. Christian had closed his eyes at some point and realized he was trembling. You did well, Balthazar assured him. I need to test my abilities in a controlled setting, Christian said, trying to keep any shaking out of his voice. I am here, Christian. I wouldn't let you do anything dangerous that I couldn't save you from. Now. Let's go up, quiet as mice, Balthazar said. The vampire lord had let him go. His trembling had eased, and yet Christian felt so bereft. Yet he knew that he was safe. Though this situation would have been dangerous to others, he knew that with Balthazar that it was controlled. He wasn't going to let his guard down, but he realized that he didn't need to be terrified either. Christian was reminded of his and Julian's childhoods, where they would go play Bloody Mary or ghosts in the graveyard, where they and their friends would be scared of the dark, but knew in the back of their heads that they were truly safe in the upper middle class neighborhood. It was the same now. They were doing what seemed like a dangerous thing, 
what likely was a dangerous thing for others, but not for them. Balthazar was completely in control. They ghosted up the black, painted metal stairs. The metal didn't even rattle beneath their feet. Christian realized that he could consciously adjust the weight of his footsteps to make them utterly silent. It was fascinating. All too soon they were crouched outside of the fourth-story apartment where the couple was arguing. The woman's voice was soft and pleading. She was crying. Christian could hear the pain in her voice. The boyfriend had likely struck her and was edging to get inside and end this. But Balthazar held a hand on his shoulder and kept them crouching down just beneath the lip of the still. Christian glanced over the top of it and was nearly blinded by two lamps on the side tables, though they were low wattage. He blinked and his eyes teared. In that brief moment, before being nearly blinded, he had seen a man, white, about six foot with tattoos all down his arms of skulls and vines, in a white t-shirt and faded jeans, gripping the shoulders of a dark-haired young woman with golden-toned skin and green eyes. She wore jeans and a yellow top. Her makeup was streaked from tears and she was trying to twist out of the man's hands. I didn't! She wailed. I just went to work. Jason is my boss. I have to talk to him. The man shook her violently as if she was some kind of ragdoll. Her head snapped back and forth with a painful clicking sound. The apartment smelled of old blood, rancid food and despair. Christian knew that no one here was happy. The sense of being trapped was in every grey, dirty angle of the apartment. He couldn't stand it. I know you were flirting with him. I know what you are. You whore. He snarled. Christian's jaw tightened. He wanted to leap up and grab this arsehole by the throat and shake him until he knew what pain she felt. Before he knew it, he actually had leaped into the apartment. Balthazar hadn't stopped him. The boyfriend caught sight of him and shouted, Who the fuck are you? At first, Christian looked back at Balthazar, who was leisurely coming in through the window. The vampire lord was letting him take the lead. Christian whipped around towards the couple as he heard the boyfriend throw the girl into the wall and advance upon him. She bounced off the plaster painfully and rubbed the back of her head with a dazed expression on her face. The boyfriend's lips were peeled back from his teeth in a snarl and his hands were raised up to punch Christian. Now, Christian, your reflexes are quite a bit better than his. Let him come at you so you can see what I mean practically, Balthazar said matter-of-factly. Christian turned back to the boyfriend just as the bastard was throwing his first punch. Time seemed to slow to a crawl, while Christian's movements appeared at normal speed. He effortlessly stepped outside of the puncher's range. Another punch came, and another. Again, simply stepping right or left, kept him well out of range of getting hit. What the hell? The boyfriend shouted. The faintest trace of fear was entering his voice. Christian knew that his movements were inexplicably fast. Now, Christian, can you feel his mind? It's a coarse, pathetic thing. Hardly used, but it's there. He's all spittle and malt liquor. Can you capture it? Balthazar asked. Christian concentrated on feeling the boyfriend's mind. It wasn't hard. It was like a red haze in the air. Red equaled violence and stupidity all at once. Christian reached for it mentally and grasped it. It was squishy, and the boyfriend drew in a sharp breath before going almost limp. Don't squeeze, Balthazar warned. You'll turn him into a vegetable. Just hold him as if you were gripping a thin piece of crystal stemware. He's hardly as expensive or as interesting, but he's delicate. Christian frowned and lessened his mental grip. The boyfriend blinked and looked perplexed at Christian and Balthazar being in the apartment, but he wasn't violent, just mildly annoyed. The girlfriend, on the other hand, was focusing on them with huge eyes. She was terrified. She opened her mouth to scream, but Balthazar put a finger to his lips and her mouth went lax. No scream issued. Now he is truly yours to do whatever you want with, Christian. His mind is completely pliable. Whatever you want him to know or not know. If we just drink from him and don't kill him, will he hurt her again another day? Christian asked. Balthazar was silent for a moment. Christian didn't know if he was truly looking into the mind of the boyfriend or just relying upon his understanding of human nature. But finally Balthazar said, He will. He'll just kill her another day. 
Unless, of course, we alter their minds. Alter them in what way? We give her the agency to leave him. We give him the belief that if he comes around her, something bad will happen to him. Balthazar shrugged. Christian considered this. I want to alter them. I mean, I want you to alter their minds. Don't you want to try? I don't think I want to scramble somebody's mind. Even this asshole's, Christian said. All right. But just all right? Christian asked. I understand what you want. Tis an easy fix. Balthazar shrugged again. Christian felt an upwelling of outrage, but then he stopped himself as a revelation came to him. You don't go after evildoers often, do you? Balthazar shook his head. You come to find that there are endless amounts of them. The same dirty story played out again and again, with victims needing the strength to leave and villains acting out of a rage they don't understand. Often it is because they were hurt when they were still very young. Other times, they are just poison from the beginning. So you see it as pointless? To help one when there are so many others in the exact same spot? Christian felt a wave of despair. Were humans also predictable? And worse, the same? Would he develop a laissez-faire attitude towards them too? This time, Balthazar cupped his cheek. I will help them if you wish me to. Perhaps it will have a good effect. A ripple effect on others they will touch. I want you to help them, Christian said. The two humans stood like empty dolls before them, unmoving, unseeing. Balthazar crossed to them. He went to the boyfriend first. He was none too gentle when he tipped the man's head to the side and bit into his flesh. The rich, coppery scent of blood flooded the room. Christian found himself leaning forward and his eyelids fluttering halfway shut as if he were a starving man that had smelled roasting meat. The boyfriend let out a sigh as Balthazar finished with him and let him sink to the ground. Before Balthazar went to the girl, he leaned down and murmured something into the boyfriend's ear. The boyfriend's eyes widened but then went dull again. He nodded. Christian knew he would not bother the girl again. Christian barely registered when Balthazar went to the girl. He spoke to her first, much longer than to the boyfriend. Her gaze seemed empty for a long time, but then she gave one brief nod. Then he drank from her, too. Balthazar then arranged the two of them. The girl he put in the bedroom and placed the thin coverlet over her. The boyfriend he put on the couch. The way he angled him, Christian was sure that it would be clear to him that he was to leave the girl without even speaking a word to her. Christian's stomach felt like an empty sack, but he didn't want to feed in this desperate, terrible apartment that reeked of mold and bad memories. The vampire lord obviously felt the same way as he didn't try to embrace Christian to exchange blood. He and Balthazar stole out of the apartment the same way they had come. They slipped into the Mercedes convertible and raced out of town. Christian found he couldn't breathe until they were on the highway and far from that apartment. The ride back to the manor took far less time, or so it seemed to Christian, and he was so glad. Tension bled from his shoulders the moment they pulled into the garage. The engine ticked once it was turned off. Balthazar, not speaking, took his hand and the two of them went into the garden. They sat down on a smooth wooden bench, which faced a wide swath of the sky. Though there was no sign of the sun, Christian knew it was coming. He turned towards Balthazar. Thank you, he whispered. I know it's a drop in the bucket. I know it probably doesn't mean anything, but... It means something to you, and that's all that matters. Balthazar stared at the sky, not looking at him. Christian found himself leaning his head on Balthazar's shoulder. We're each individuals. We each matter. Of course, Balthazar said, though Christian wasn't sure he truly agreed. The wind whistled through the trees and the scent of flowers flowed over them. Are you hungry? Starving, Christian admitted. All right, let's feed you. The next section of the podcast has been edited out to keep it suitable for a general audience. To get the full version, either subscribe to Wraith Rain as a member or buy the audiobook from the Wraith Rain shop. The Everdark Podcast by X Aratare is performed by Edward Fox, Adam Riley, Jay Thelis, Bruno Devant, Kelly Michaels, and Hannah Hart.
with Liz Gentle as Seer. Edited by Matthew Prince. Continuity by Adriel Wiggins. Everdark is produced by Wraith Rain Publishing in association with Her Grace Reed Studios. Copyright 2022 by Wraith Rain Publishing.